This is the next question. When we are in the waking state, we remember that we were in a dream state. Right. But when we are in the dream state, we have no awareness of a waking state. Yeah, that is true. But that is because we don't want to be aware of the waking state. We have to live in our own world. If we remember the waking state and think that in the waking state, suppose I am a beggar. In the dream state, I am a king. Who would want to remember the waking state? So the very effect, the very reason for dream state is to forget everything about the waking state so that you live in your own beautiful world or bad, bad world, whichever world you want. So that is built in, that you do not remember the waking state. But in waking state, you can remember the dream state. And you will know that it is a dream state because you say, now I am not experiencing it, it's a dream. But when you are dreaming, you are not dreaming, you are actually experiencing it. Got what I'm trying to say. Is the practice of observing the dreaming and waking states the only practical activity possible towards an understanding of the observer? Or is this observation also a mind activity? Yes, this is one of the ways which the Upanishads have prescribed for figuring out the observer. But the observer which is observing now is also part of your mind. When it has completely become merged with the idea that that supreme thing that you are trying to figure out, the witness, cannot be described or defined in any way, then there is no, observ there is no observed, there is only the observer. And the observer is the Supreme Brahman in Turiya. Actually, it is very simple to understand. Uh, my mind, I think that I, my mind is an observer. The real observer is not my mind, it is the Atman. I think my mind is the observer and it is observing myself. What is it observing? My own thoughts. Who is observing? What am I observing? One part of my mind I am trying to split separately and this part is observing the other part and saying that this is the observer. Right? I am observing. What am I observing? My own mind is observing my mind. And the observer is made up of all the things that it is observing. It is not different. I mean it is very simple. It is not different. When you realize this, then you are doing nothing. When you are doing nothing, then that witness is. Not when you are doing something. Not laziness. <laughs> it's hard work. You are saying, okay, now I am watching my mind. Then I say, my mind means what? My thoughts. And when I say, I am watching, what is that? That is thought. So one part of me has built itself up as me. And it is watching the other part, which is also thought. Both me and that are built of the same material called thought. When I then see this face to face and say, what to do now? Nothing. There is no doing anything after that. When that there is no doing, then that observer only remains. And that observer is not this mind observer, but that which makes the mind feel that it is observing. <coughs> that can happen only when the mind is completely tranquil, when it is not attempting, which is why the great Buddhist teachers, Zurchungpa said, there is no samsara and there is no nirvana. Nirvana for what? Which what is always free, where do you seek nirvana? And when that is there, then where is samsara? <coughs> so when there is no grasping of anything, when there is an absolute let go, let go and rejoice simply means you're not trying to create an image of the witness and trying to reach there. When you're actually sitting quietly and saying, this is the end, it's finished. <laughs> you can do nothing about it. Some people call that surrender. When I say I can do nothing about it, forget it. Then what happens? 
then there is only the real witness. Because till now I was interfering with that witness in its original state. I don't know, it is, this is why it was called Guhya and Rahasya because it's difficult to grasp what we are trying to do. But I am sure there is a hint of understanding of what we are doing. In your explanation of the first sloka, you say that the past, the present and the future are in home at the same time. Does it, did I say that? Okay, let's uh, look at it this way. According to the understanding of Vedanta, what we call future is already there but we understand it only when we reach there. So what if one comes to a state where he sees everything at once? Then there is no past, present and future for that person. There is only present. Okay. We look at it in another way. Actually the mind can think of only one thing at a time. It cannot think of many things at a time. Yeah, there are many things in the horizon. It can only think of one thing. Just as the eye cannot see except one thing at a time. When I am looking at her, even though all the other images fall, I am only looking at her. I can only see her, even though you are also sitting here. And then if I have to uh, see you, then I have to look at you. In the same way the mind also engages itself only in one thing at a time. But it does it so fast, you cannot make out the point where it goes from one to another. It's like uh, the old films used to be there, you know, in the movies. Now it's all digital. For one frame where somebody is slapping someone, it takes six frames. And one the hand is like this, one like this, one like this, one like this. But, so there are all different actions, right? Like different thoughts at one time. When they are rolled at a certain speed, you see it as a continuous action. So, what we see as a continuous chain of thought is actually single, single thoughts coming and forming a chain. That means one thought is here, it has gone and another one has come. And the, the interval is so infinitesimal that you can't say where it comes and when it went. Suppose you can grasp that gap, then you've done it. Nothing else to do. And the first step in grasping that is to understand that there is a gap. Between one thought has come and the other has not yet come, the first is going in the other, in between there is a gap. Pretty small gap. Normally we cannot grasp it. But if and when you think about it and say, maybe one day you will grasp it. If you grasp it, then you have come to the, the essence from which all thoughts rise. No more thought troubles you. Thoughts may come, but you have touched the core, the source, the core. So two, I gave you one description, I'm giving the third. Suppose uh, we were driving now and coming on this crowded road. Right now, does that period exist with Nathan? Huh? With the great Nath, it doesn't exist. She is... Uh, very fortunate to see. She has a driver who is not. <laughs> so, that is over, right? Now, in a minute this will be over. So it's moving. We like, but we will not let go of not, like I did just. So as human beings are concerned, the past is only there in memory form. So it is not there. It does not exist. It's there as a memory. It actually does not exist. Because here I am here, sitting comfortably. There is no memory of that traffic. I am not in that traffic. I have a memory of the traffic, which is the past. Right now, I think I am in the present. But soon this will become a memory. And future, I know nothing about. I say, 
that in future, after this is over, perhaps she is going to give me lunch. <laughs> I mean, this is only a projection. I actually don't know. She might say, oh, I'm sorry, today there was no gas finished. But, but we, this is our life. We live like that. We, past really does not exist, but we hold on to it. Mm -hmm. Present is there, but we will not allow it to slip. And future we don't know, but we like to project. This is our life, past, present and future. So the Upanishad says, Om is all these three. And when you understood this, you realize that there is only the present in our hands. We don't have the future, we don't have the past. Except as memory and except as a projection. What is that? The present. But then, we, the present is so precious that we try to hold on to it. The moment you try to hold on to it, it's finished. It's gone into the past. We try to... The whole um, hmm, uh, idea of photography is that actually everything keeps moving. But our human mind in its satisfaction wants to freeze it. And this is photograph. Freeze. It really doesn't freeze, it moves. So therefore we know it moves, therefore we want to freeze that moment. Right? It's true. I mean, this is the whole idea, to freeze, but you can't freeze it. It moves. So Om means the movement, that constant movement. When you understand this, you are no more trying to grasp and hold it, you are allowing it to go. And you are allowing the past to go because you know it's only a memory, it doesn't exist. Then you are in the present. And when you are in the present, then you are with the witness which is yourself, true witness, which is not different from the Brahman according to the Upanishads. That uh, lunch part was a joke. <laughs> 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 Take me seriously. <laughs> Is there a practice with Omkar which can help us tune in with into the eternal? Yes, there is. Um, you know, in the science of yoga, there are many practices to purify your mind and make it quiet and tranquil because the definition of yoga is yoga is chitta vritti nirodha the capacity, the, the art of trying to clear the mind of all its distractive waves in my translation, free translation the stopping of all the distractive waves the movement of waves, the mind, all thoughts are like waves up, down the capacity to stop it. So there are many ways of doing it. The chanting is there, pranayama is there and so on. Now in pure Vedanta, which believe that everything that exists is the Brahman and there is nothing else. Or even the very fact of duality that there is this world and that is an illusion and there is only the Brahman. They, it, there is a tendency among some of these people to think that simply by understanding this theoretically you can reach the Brahman. But you can't. So even they who do not want to practice yoga, considering it as Sankhya and not part of Vedanta, do practice an exercise which is similar to Pranayam and which is connected with Omkar. So even they the so-called Dashanam order have to practice what is called Omkar Sadhana. Now Omkar Sadhana means, of course, you have to follow other procedures of Yama and rules and regulations, starting one being Ahimsa and so on. Having done that, you sit in a comfortable place and then you chant the O. Now you see this? The Om should be chanted as it is mentioned in the Mandukya. 
Mundaka also says chant the Om. There are many Upanishads because they consider it as a link between the supreme reality and yourself. The chanting is done like this. Taking a breath and then chant Om. Now, if you want to chant again, what will you have to do? So it becomes a pranayam also, right? Even though you don't, you say I don't do pranayam. So, so if you practice this regularly, this Om, it becomes both a. a um, training of your prana and also the sound which is the nearest to the Supreme Brahman. And if you constantly chant it, at some point it will become a silent chant in your mind. And at some point that will also cease and there will be only the witness. So this is the technique of home. Many disciplines use this technique of home. It actually sounds so simple but it is very very effective. At least it calms your mind down and makes you quiet inside. That much it will do. Uh, if you are ashamed of chanting it because other people will hear, you can chant it mentally at home. Nobody hears it. Nowadays people are ashamed of saying Om because then you will be misunderstood as a Hindu. You see, it's a problem here. <coughs> so there is nothing to worry, just chant Om. <coughs> so, it's like this. Oh. Again. So this is a beautiful sadhana. Anybody can do it. Sit down quietly and do it for a, at least 10 minutes continuously. And then stop doing and just sit down and see what's going on. With the understanding that in my original state, I am a free something which is not bound by any of my thoughts. With this understanding, sit quietly and watch what's happening. So then it becomes, the chanting of Om then becomes a sadhana. Which is why the Upanishad says, use Om as the arrow and hit the target of the Brahman. And when you are doing it, either use your heart center and think it's coming out from here or think that it's coming out from here. Either way is fine. Those who are, who are, who are uh, emotional, those who are like into uh, arts and music, it, heart is a good center to stay. There they are. Or if you are the yogic type, then this is the better center. And people I don't know, no music, nothing. Then what? So for them, this center is better. So this is called the Omkar Dhuni, which can actually be practiced as a practical exercise, apart from the theory. So that is how one builds the higher level of consciousness that the Upanishads speak of. First, by thinking over all that we discussed and then by sitting down every day and chanting the Om. 